And my name is Alice Carley. I live around the corner on Warwick Avenue, so I just walked here. Um, I've been doing research on a bill that is up for consideration in the New York State Legislature this year. It is called the New York Health Act, and I think it is worth knowing about. Um, about a week after the election in November, I saw something posted up somewhere that some people <coughs> were getting together to talk about a single-payer health care bill for New York State. And I thought, wow, that's cool, especially now, and decided to go. Uh, I was at Metro Justice, and about 40 other people saw it and decided to go there too, which was further exciting, and um, it's gotten more interesting as I've learned more about what's going on. Um, let me go to the next slide. How many people out of the five of us here um, think that the whole discussion of healthcare costs is overblown and it is not really much of a problem? Yeah, I think. Uh, this figure shows how the amount spent on health care in 2011 in member countries of the Organization for Economic Development. That has 35 members. It's all of Europe, plus the US, Canada, Mexico, Chile, South Korea, Japan, New Zealand, Israel, and Turkey. How their expenditure <coughs> relates to life expectancy. And then the figure for New York is also added in. As you can see, we're kind of towards the bottom of that average mid-range of life expectancy, right about 80 years, but we're spending two or three times as much as the average on health care. I'm having trouble keeping up with doctor bills, despite great coverage from my job. Uh, how many people here are feeling the same kind of a pinch? Yeah. Um, Ms. Burns recommended to me an interesting book. Uh, An American Sickness by Elizabeth Rosenthal, um, examining how health care costs came to balloon so dramatically in the past 30 years. And that is something I have definitely noticed, because I've been working for 25 years, and I've seen how insurance costs have risen a lot faster than the cost of living during that period. Um, she is a physician and health care journalist. And she breaks down individual aspects of our healthcare system, insurance, doctors, hospitals, drug and device companies, to look at how regulations that were intended to promote health have been exploited to promote profit instead. Uh, she points to love of money as being the basic root of the evil and includes a list of 10 rules that lead directly to the high cost of American health care. From page eight of her book, and then she spends the rest of the book, just like I say, examining different aspects of health care in the United States. Uh, there they are. Some of them are quite horrific. Look at rule number two. Um, can everybody see them okay? All right. uh, number 10 is bog standard business principle, as are most of the others. But take a look at number six, which is special to, well, healthcare, there may be a few other things. The perverse action of competition in healthcare results from two things. The lack of transparency in billing, so that neither patients nor doctors can easily find out what is actually being charged for what. And the fact that insurers who are competing for the business of doctors, hospitals, and drug companies, who are their most powerful customers, more so than individuals, have to offer higher payments, not lower ones, in order to attract those customers. We've all noticed news about shocking hikes in the prices of old drugs that have been on the market for a long time, and then their companies are bought out. And we're all aware of how many doctors choose to specialize because there's more money in it, even though there's a huge need for general practitioners. How many have noticed how posh hospitals have become over the past several decades? I was given this for free when I went in for a, um, a uh, check over at the Pluto Cancer Center um, to arrange for a breast biopsy. How many of those do they make? And why? What am I going to do with this? Uh, I will note that my experience of the biopsy surgery was very heartening. 
Uh, the use of resources all seemed very appropriate. The staff at Highland were fantastic. I haven't seen the bill yet. Uh, in any case, profit in healthcare has long been a private hobby horse of mine. Since in systems terms, profit seems to me incredibly dangerous to healthcare, just as Dr. Rosenthal has shown empirically in her book. When you are selling something, would you rather sell something you hope people want or something you know they need? If you have cancer or might one day develop it, how likely are you to refuse treatment because of the cost? I didn't. Treating healthcare just like any other commodity to be sold for profit makes a recipe for exactly the situation we find ourselves in right now. If you could sell health, then the standard rules regarding competition and profit would work a little better. People who produce the best health at the lowest cost could be expected to succeed. But when you are selling treatment for illness, you have no economic incentive to reduce the incidence of illness. In fact, quite the reverse. That uh, explains a lot of what we see here. And I'm not saying that there are not, you know, that most doctors don't care more about their patients. I've seen, I've met a lot of doctors, half the people who came to that meeting back in November were doctors and medical, medical students. They want to treat the patient. Um, but on the other hand, economics militate against it. So the question is what to do about it. The New York Health Act is one response. It is an effort to control health care costs by directly addressing that rule number six that I mentioned by eliminating for-profit insurance. It was first drafted about 20 years ago by New York State Assemblyman Richard Gottfried, who is still in the Assembly and is still pushing it. Uh, and it passed again in the Assembly this afternoon. I'm happy to say, uh, but not too surprised. It has, that's, it did pass last year and the year before as well in the assembly. The bill is all there, ready to be enacted. It's never gotten out of committee in the Republican Senate because it goes so strongly against free market values. The bill provides for a ramping up period during which a commission drawn from across the state with representatives from communities healthcare providers and state government will work out how to collect federal and state funds into a usable single payment source, negotiate with providers and pharmaceutical companies, and determine how high individual premiums need to be to cover care at current standards. The devil will, of course, be in the details, but the bill charges the commission with providing a high standard of care and specifies that any person may choose any provider and providers must provide prompt and competent care. There's a section on provider accountability covering this. Opponents of the bill say that if everyone in the state could go to the doctor at any time they wanted with no deductible copay or insurance, as the bill requires, the cost would balloon so high that the premiums, which would be assessed like current Medicare tax, would be much too high. There are two analyses of this particular bill, and they come to opposite conclusions in this regard. One, saying there would be significant savings. The other, that the tax would be too high. Uh, they both involve, involve data drawn from many sources and more or less complex analyses. And I have not been able to fully unravel the approaches enough to separate the apples from the oranges for comparison. Though I have formed some ideas about the basis of the approaches. But in any case, I first want to cover what is in the bill itself. And that's most of what I'm going to be doing in the next few minutes. Here's the first nine lines of the bill, which I have presented here exactly as they appear, including the line numbers that make it easy to cite by page and line. It's a little distracting to read, but very handy. As you see here, section one is the title. Section two gets right into it, and it's worth reading the quote from the state constitution. Ah, uh, the state constitution states, the protection and promotion of the health of the inhabitants of the state are matters of public concern and provision, therefore, shall be made by the state and by such of its subdivisions and in such manner and by such means as the legislature shall from time to time determine. 
That's the end of the quote from the state constitution. The next line begins, what the legislature would now assert if they vote for the bill. Namely, that not only is the promotion of health a concern of the state, but also that all residents of the state have a right to health care. Uh, and I will know you can get this online, and I'll be telling people how you can do it. The rest of section two describes the problem of rising health care costs and outlines the creation of a single New York fund cobbled together from all current federal and state sources as the basis of a single payer system that will eliminate private health insurance. Each bullet here represents one or more paragraphs in the bill in the order in which they appear. So bear with me on following through the rest of the bill to see how it all fits together. This is still part of section two, the basic outline. The bill will promote, but not require, movement away from fee-for-service payment and encourage collaborative arrangements. We'll come back to these. The employment benefit referred to at the bottom, or er, no, in the middle, uh, refers to the way employers currently pay <coughs> a large part of their employees' insurance cost. The bill proposes to keep that as it is. You'll see how that works a little further down. The current Article 50 of the New York Public Health Law is the closing verbiage of the law. And it, by this bill, gets renumbered as Article 80 instead, I suppose in order to leave space for other future editions. But all of what follows in this long upcoming section we're going to see is proposed additions to New York Public Health Law. Section 3 starts with a big list of terms like board, coordination of care, resident, participating provider, etc. And it goes on to outline how the transition from the current multiple source insurance to a single payer system will actually happen. And key to it is this board. The composition of the board is one of the most specific sections of the bill. All the board members are Albany appointees, but appointments are spread around. There's 14 appointed by the governor, and then the uh, majority and minority leaders in each house appoint some and so forth. Uh, and there is a laundry list of stakeholders, as you can see. Patients are not listed as a stakeholder group, but since every board member and all of the state representatives appointing them will now be covered by the new system, there will no longer be a special health care for state uh, legislature, they will all in fact belong to that group. One item specified back in section two is that there will be no source, other source of coverage. And here it specifies that the board will be covered by the plan. So the people who make the decisions will have to live with them. Here we see a bunch of problems put off for two years. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid covers most of the long-term care in New York. Uh, and that bill will be carved out of Medicaid share of the health care pot until the proposal to take it over is done. Uh, the ultimate success of the plan will certainly depend, in part, on the success of these pro uh, proposals for long-term care, for retiree benefits, and workers' comp. One of the points made against this bill is the likelihood that it will attract sick, uninsured people to the state. Those who, having adequate health care, can return to work, can start paying taxes and support the program, but retirees will need another approach. Here is the benefit package spelled out in very general terms. An Urban Institute analysis of Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All plan at the national level notes that in calculating the high cost, its methodology accounts for the fact that there are not enough primary care physicians in the country to actually accommodate all patients, which limits the total cost of care. On the other hand, the way they chose to account for that model for that is to model their calculation using the number of people now on Medicaid who cannot access health care because providers won't take Medicaid. And I don't think that model works when there is no longer a difference in pay. So I want to take a minute. Um, well, I don't know. I was going to do a show of hands. How many people in this room, well, yeah, would have gone to a doctor within the past year but couldn't get an appointment? That did not happen to me, and it didn't happen to anybody here. I'm glad. 
Did anybody decide not to visit a doctor in the past year because of the cost? Did anybody go to an, insurance, an emergency room because they didn't have insurance for a primary care physician? That's another uh, All of those changes would factor into the actual cost of care under the bill. Care coordination is one way to save on health care. When you have someone making sure that different providers for different health problems are all talking to each other, you both get better care and don't have so much occasion for tests done twice and other unnecessary treatment. And the designation of standards for care is also key to success for the plan. Once you have government involvement in contracts, the notion of accepting the lowest bid will come to mind, though this is contracting, not bidding. So it's not <coughs> the same. But in that atmosphere, having all providers held to the same standards and having those standards be adequate for good care is crucial. Finally, if the department makes available the information regarding care, quality, cost, and outcome that is required of providers in order to remain in good standing and renew their licenses, that alone will make an enormous difference in reining in costs, since it is the obfuscation of that information that lets providers at all levels charge for unnecessary care. There's provision for this that we'll get to later. Here's another very meaty section, once again with most of the meat left up to that 26-person board to determine. Most of the savings that would make it possible to cover all New Yorkers would result from savvy and transparent negotiations, experimental payment methodologies that make health rather than treatment the central commodity, and hawk-like interest among the legislatures and the general public in cost effectiveness. One of my interests in having the government as a single payer is that negotiation details would be open to FOIA, Freedom of Information Request, and that healthy taxpayers will have a stake in pursuing cost effectiveness while they're healthy and can think clearly. I think both of these should obtain with this bill, but I have not seen any accounting for them and analyses of the cost. And success here does depend heavily on citizen involvement. This is, after all, Ellen we're talking about. All three of these, capital expenditures, medical education, and out-of-state and therefore out-of-network services, are important. Perhaps especially the medical education given the problem of insufficient primary care staffing. All of this is mentioned pretty generally, however, and all again up to that big board to figure out in detail. Note the requirement for simplification, transparency, etc. so desirable for quality and cost-effective care is specified here in relation to standards for providers in order to maintain their licenses. I do not yet know how much of this already exists on paper in current law. Once again, a lot rests on the board and on citizen involvement. Here is what I like to see though, a direct statement that payments will not be calculated to accommodate profit, and even more importantly, that all providers will permit examination of records. And here is where the fact that the big board includes a cross-section of stakeholders and is directed to consult all interested parties can make it accountable. This could get us to the kind of transparency needed to see whether we, as supporting taxpayers, are getting what we're paying for which as insured parties, we currently have very little way to do. There is a long discussion in these sections of what kinds of intervention could be needed if, for instance, the federal government refuses to allow the state to pool Medicaid money and instead requires individual Medicaid billing per patient and per treatment as it is done now. This would add a layer of bookkeeping and necessitate not only that all Medicaid treatments be billed to the federal government as now, though the provider payments will end up larger under the program, but also that each individual Medicaid recipient specifically agrees and directs by contract that the New York Health Program receives the federal payments for their care. Anyone who does not agree to this would have to remain on standard Medicaid and not be a member of the Health Act, and that's what I mean by messy. Hopefully that won't happen, but we don't know. In this regard, 
the contracting of nonprofits to provide help with initial enrollment is quite important. The funds for retraining former insurance employers, employees are also quite important since the insurance companies employ roughly 300,000 people in New York. Meanwhile, the data collection is actually another important point regarding not only promoting health, but also promoting cost effectiveness through tracking health outcomes. Price tag unknown. The regional advisory councils are an interesting and potentially very important inclusion. The fact that the meetings are required to be public and to report on regional plan evaluations is an important means of transparency since reports prepared for the purpose of negotiation at the state level are specifically protected from FOIA requests. We'll get to that shortly. Uh, here is where the transparency can and should happen. Regional provider payment methodologies will include some provision to provide for, but not exaggerate, geographical differences in actual costs over the state. And here at the regional level, is where the information on quality, cost, and outcome of care that all providers are required to submit for license renewal should reach the general public. Even if a requirement that this information be published in an easily accessible manner is not included in the bill, and I haven't found it, uh, it must be recorded and evaluated at these public regional meetings, where it will be accessible to the type of citizen organizations that are already publishing such information. Deep breath. Financing for all of this. If the bill is enacted, the governor has a year to come up with a proposal for it in the executive budget. And here comes the new tax that pays for everything, substitutes for the premiums, deductibles, co-insurance, co-pays, and out-of-pocket payments that we are currently making for health care. This is what the opponents of the bill say will be too high and will drive wealthy, healthy people out of New York. Note that this is partly because the tax will be progressive. That is, richer people will have to pay a higher percentage, just like with income tax. The bill does not actually suggest how much that tax will be, what percentage, or how progressive. It leaves it up to that committee. But there is no question that a healthy, wealthy person will end up paying, if they're wealthy enough, more for health care than they are now. The question is, where that line between those who pay more and those who pay less will fall. The rosiest of the analyses estimates that 2% of New Yorkers, yeah, that 2% that we've been hearing about, will pay more than they are now, and the rest of us will pay less. The opposing analysis does not suggest <coughs> specifics. It just says it will be more than we would like to believe and more than high-income residents are willing to pay. Uh, here are more details on the transition, including that employment benefit. Ah, uh, yeah. I mentioned earlier, uh, direction that it has to deal with phasing the program in and covering special situations. Yeah. I am, I am ahead of myself. I passed that bit already. Section 5, negotiations. Uh, regulations regarding the bargaining process. It's added to the existing public health law just before the part with the big overall program description for Section 3. So this again goes into the public health law. The authorization of collective negotiations allows providers to bargain in groups through representatives, though the state can also negotiate with individual competing providers, which is interesting. Uh, paragraph 4296, confidentiality, requires that reports required by the department for the negotiations will not be subject to the Freedom of Information Act. Um, that's why I'm interested to see that there are other ways to get at, in an ongoing way, uh, that information. These sections <coughs> relate to cost containment. In Section 6, the New York Health Act replaces the Family Health Plus program as a state public health plan in the section on preferred drug and clinical drug review programs. It looks like this means that under the New York Health Plan, a doctor would need to show cause 
for prescribing a non-preferred drug in the way they now need to do so for Medicaid. And that could be important, and it could use more research. Uh, section 7 describes the watchdogs. Repeat that, would you? statement you said before, the doctors would have to do well? Uh, doctors, as, and this is, when I say more research, I mean I need to dig deeper to understand this better, but right now it looks like uh, we will end up with a drug formulary the way insurance companies have, and that if a doctor prescribes like an expensive brand name drug instead of its generic equivalent, <coughs> they will have to say why, and there will have to be a medical reason. Um, sections 8 through 10 have more details about making the transition immediately after the act goes into effect. That's the end. It would be nice to have a trustworthy analysis of the likely result of the enactment of the bill. What we actually have instead is two analyses. One very detailed one prepared by a longtime proponent of single-payer health care and another rather shorter and less detailed rebuttal by a writer for a right-leaning think tank. I also have included on the slide a related analysis, not of the New York Health Act, but of the Bernie Sanders proposal for Medicare for All. My sense on reading them is that this third one is the least partisan, and it is sobering to note that their conclusion is that the rise in taxes necessary to implement Medicare for All at the federal level would be considerably higher than Bernie Sanders' estimate. But this is apples and oranges. They're two different plans done in two different ways. To give a concrete example of what I mean, the New York Health Act bill describes the payroll deductions used to supplement the pooled federal health care money, like Medicaid, Medicare, and so forth, as premiums. And they do, in fact, take the place of premiums, deductive, deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance. But they are automatically deducted from wages or billed at tax time, like taxes. I currently earn about $52,000 a year as a conservator in an academic library. At least that's my, my total salary. According to Gerald Friedman's recommendation for the progressive payroll deduction required by the bill based on his analysis, me and the University of Rochester between us would pay nothing for the first $25,000, 9% of the next $25,000, and 10% of the top $2,000 for a total of $2,700 a year. My share of that, because the university pays 80%, that's the employer benefit, uh, would be $540 a year with U of R owing $2,160. So I would expect to have $45 deducted from my paycheck each month. As my full payment to replace my family plan, that would be nothing short of incredible. I currently pay between five and $6,000 a year, all told, for my family plan. My husband is self-employed and earns less than $25,000 a year, so he wouldn't be taxed. Uh, and we all have some health issues. My employer pays $15,412. So I would save about 90% of what I spend now, and my employer about 85%. On the other hand, a married couple, each of whom is a highly paid administrator earning, say, $250,000 a year, would now, instead of sharing a family plan, exactly like mine, instead, or they would owe a premium of $6,000 each. I could see why they might be a little ticked. And even more so if part of that were from dividends and capital gains, which they don't split with their employers, who, by the way, would each now owe $24,000. Now we begin to see why this plan is making slow headway among wealthy capitalists. I will note that it might also be scary to at least wealthy or very successful small business people who are earning a lot of money, but on the other hand, their businesses would be paying a good deal less uh, for their employees. So that's something interesting for them to keep in mind. Think about the people on Wall Street who earn millions in capital gains each year. Those figures would make one's head go round and round. You can hear my tiny violin playing, uh, but this would be pretty serious redistribution of income. 
And that is assuming that Friedman's cost figures are more or less correct, which Hammond disputes. The basis of their figures, however, go far enough into the statistical weeds of competing sets of facts produced by competing methodologies and ideologies that I'm not ready to say I completely agree with either analysis or even the Urban Institute one, which is in any case examining a different proposal. I agree that Friedman likely has some rose color in his glasses and that the tax may be rather too progressive. But I don't agree that the bill should be scrapped, and I think that Hammond cherry-picks his figures and even more of his assumptions about the role of free market in for-profit healthcare. Frankly, given the way healthcare costs are currently assessed, any premium that is actually spread across all workers could actually be regressive. We could reverse the percentage curve with 16% on that, that next 25,000 and up to 99% on top, keeping that 25,000 floor, and still cut the cost considerably and immeasurably to poor and middle classes. I mean, I would only be, I would be paying, I would only be saving about 75% um, instead of 90%. Okay? Uh, in any case, getting to what I would consider to be an accurate forecast would take a lot more research. Rather than try to reinvent a wheel that I'm not qualified to engineer, I want to finish by looking more globally at the pros and cons of the bill. So let's look at what we actually know. Replacing for-profit insurance and negotiating with providers, drug and device companies from a basis of considerable strength in numbers is explicitly included in the bill, as is a public accounting of healthcare quality, cost, and outcome on at least a regional basis. Replacing the current payment model of single or family plans with deductibles and copays with one that spreads across the ideal insurance pool 100% means that the people who pay the most for health care will be those most able instead of those least able to afford it. I consider that a pro, although healthy wealthy people, will certainly lose something by it. No matter how the negotiations with providers pan out, it will mean much simpler billing for them, which is why many doctors and even more medical students are excited about this bill. Less time dickering with insurers means more time treating patients. The bill also explicitly includes coordination of care and experimenting with alternatives to fee-for-service payment during the negotiations with providers. All of these factors will tend to lower absolute costs as well as distributing them more equitably. <coughs> on the other hand, passing this bill will put us on the cutting edge, aka the bleeding edge, of US healthcare funding. Hammond says that Friedman overestimates the savings due to administrative costs and underestimates the effects of sick people deliberately moving to New York. I wouldn't mind paying twice as much as Friedman's estimate, since that still cuts my bill by more than half. But if you have not paid anything previously, or if you are in an upper income bracket for whom 10% of income for healthcare is already a rude shock, I can see reason to worry. Hammond also raises the question of, this is Albany we're talking about, right? The bill does include a lot of oversight, the comptroller in charge, community and healthcare representatives, regional public hearings four times a year. And there are other ways to keep sunlight shining on this. Forewarned is forearmed. But the question is well worth asking. And there is no doubt that some unscrupulous and wealthy providers will be actively looking for new ways to game the new system, just as they have done the old, including old-fashioned graft. The question of employment upheaval is one of the big issues that has kept single payer out of the US for this long. I think it's why Obama didn't try to pursue it more vigorously. Uh, and it is specifically addressed in the text of the bill. Friedman notes that medical insurance accountants have very transferable skills, and many of them, he did this research and came up with a figure, I don't remember what it was, but uh, a lot of them already have medical training and uh, would be needed and could be used as additional care providers in some cases in the very facilities where they already work in order to accommodate the more patients. And I would note that savings and certainty regarding employer <coughs> premiums will also spur job growth in other areas of the economy. But 
the upheaval will be there. Here are the unknowns that have so far kept a single Republican senator from co-sponsoring this bill. We've already looked at each of them, so you know I cannot answer any of them myself. My own personal opinion is that the opportunities for transparency and accountability offered by the bill outweigh the risks, given that we already know that the current system is untenable and have yet to see any more free market friendly legislation that even begins to address those rules of dysfunction outlined by Dr. Rosenthal at the presentation. But I can see why it's a scary step to take. I will be more than happy to share this PowerPoint or a Word or a PDF version of it, for those that don't have Microsoft Office, with anyone. Uh, and there is a handout that includes all the information on this slide, plus phone numbers of local senators and some other sources, in case you come to a conclusion about this legislation that you'd like to share with them. Uh, the bill came up for a vote in assembly today. It passed, uh, but it still needs one more co-sponsor to bring it out of committee in the Senate because it's a Republican committee. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, getting to what you said about people, sick people coming to New York, that's already happening. We just uh, had it brought to uh, our attention an acquaintance of the family came up here from Florida because she could not get any treatment down there and look who the governor of that state is and who the governor of that state was. Um, also, one of the things that, again, the Republicans have suggested is replacing the Medicaid payment system with block grants. Yeah. That sounds like it would fit even better into that a system would, yeah, such as yeah, this. That would actually work well with this because it would be easier to fold in. Yeah. And it's interesting that the whole, you know, there was that flurry about um, uh, Schumer and Cuomo got all upset when uh, the GOP had said, well, why don't we also uh, relieve local municipalities of the, uh, the need to pay for Medicaid overages, which is something that only happens in New York State. Um, and uh, it won over some New York State uh, Congress people. It looks as if this law would do that. Yes, and this law would absolutely, it, it, it simply would it, it would transfer what are now municipal payments put onto property taxes to being a state level payment taxed across all wage earners and everybody who earns uh, significant interest from income and dividends. So that it would split it much more widely and take it out of local municipalities and their property taxes, which would be really cool, frankly. Uh, anything else? I will admit that I am not a very deep well of knowledge. I've been <laughs> doing, and I, I, I did go through the whole bill, and that's what's in it. Um, but I think there's lots more to be learned about it. And I am going to continue to just research on my own to see if I can get a sense that satisfies at least myself more about forecasts uh, of actual results of single-payer health care. But so far from what I've seen, I think the, the transparency uh, that would result and would have to result uh, would make a difference big enough to outweigh uh, a lot of the risk of covering so many people that you don't know how to pay for it. Um, because I think a lot of things that are now being paid for would quietly go away because they are actual unnecessary care. All right, well thank you guys for coming. <laughs>